So it's a pleasure to have Oleg Lazarev from Colombia uh, today uh, for our second talk, uh, telling us about the Weinstein geometry of cotangent bundles. Great. Uh, well, thank you for the invitation. Um, so I guess I'll uh, press share screen now. Right here. Okay. Um, is this is this visible? Yep. Okay. Great. All right. So I'll talk about um, cotangent bundles uh, from the Weinstein point of view. So uh, first, I'll give some background about uh, Weinstein domains. Then I'll um, state some results. I'll talk about flexibility, both from the geometric and algebraic points of view. And uh, finally, I'll talk about how to construct some subdomains. Okay, so let me begin with some background. Okay, so the, the basic idea is that if you have a exact symplectic manifold with contact boundary, and you find a isotropic sphere in there in the boundary with some framing, you can construct a new exact symplectic manifold, which I'll denote um, by x union h sub lambda. Okay. Okay, so the, the picture you should have in mind is here I have x, I have lambda and its boundary, which is called the attaching sphere. And then this process creates this new manifold on the right, this x with this handle. Is there Okay, so there's some other pieces of information in this handle. So there's the, the core of the handle, which is an isotropic disc, and the co-core, which is a co-isotropic disc of dimension two and minus K. However, the co-cores of the index N handles are actually Lagrangian with Legendre and boundary. So that's a special feature about them. And another thing is that because the, um, the cores are isotropic, the index of the handles is always at most n. And it turns out that the handles of index strictly less than n are more or less topological. I'll say what that means, but there's not much symplectic information there. And the, the interesting handles from the symplectic point of view are the N handles, which are the middle dimensional handles. Okay, so that's Weinstein handle attachment. Okay. Okay, well, what's a Weinstein domain? Well, you can iterate this Weinstein handle attachment, and Weinstein domain is just the result of iterated handle attachments, starting from the ball, this B2N, which we think of as a zero handle. So Weinstein domain is just the symplectic handle body. So here I've starting with the ball and then I'm attaching a handle. I get the second domain. I find another isotropic sphere in its boundary. I attach a handle, find another isotropic sphere, attach a handle and I get some domain at the end, which is this one. Okay. And another important thing is that this YH domain, it retracts the union of the cores, which is a singular Lagrangian skeleton. So remember I said um, the cores of the handles are isotropic and together they form a Lagrangian skeleton, which uh, in general is singular. For cotangent bundles, we will see it's actually smooth. Okay. So it turns out that um, a Weinstein presentation for a fixed uh, symplectic manifold is not unique. There are certain handle moves which change the presentation without changing the symplectic structure. So if you're interested in symplectic geometry, it makes sense to consider Weinstein domains up to um, these Weinstein handle moves or um, as they're also called uh, Weinstein homotopy. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna consider Weinstein domains up to Weinstein homotopy. So what are these moves? Well, first, you can isotope the attaching spheres through isotropics. Remember, the attaching spheres are each 
isotropic and any isotopy of them has to be through isotropics. Um, another thing is you can cancel or create handles. So this is a configuration that you can cancel. Here I have a one handle and so-called uh, canceling two handle. And the key feature is that the attaching sphere for the two handle goes through the one handle exactly once. So this whole thing looks like a half disc and you can kind of collapse that half disc uh, this way, kind of to the left and those two handles cancel. And you can reverse the procedure so you can start with no handles and then you can introduce two canceling handles like this. So cancellation is going from left to right, creation is going from right to left. That's another thing you can do. And the third thing you can do is you can handle slide. So suppose you have two handles of the same index, then you can start isotoping the attaching sphere for the left handle so that it goes over the, uh, the second handle, kind of engulfs the second handle, and finally you push the attaching sphere back down to the same uh, contact manifold where you started from. So this is a procedure where the number of handles don't change, but as we'll see, the uh, attaching spheres change quite drastically. So those are the main moves that we're gonna be interested in. Okay, and note that they're the same as smooth handle moves, except the restriction that the attaching spheres must be isotropic. So that's where the symplectic condition comes in in this isotropicness of the attaching spheres. So a natural question uh, is what do Weinstein presentations of X tell us about X? You have symplectic manifold X, you have uh, a whole space of Weinstein presentations for it by doing these moves. Uh, what, what, what is this good for? So it turns out that any Weinstein presentation gives you a, a certain submanifold, which is called the Weinstein subdomain of the original manifold. Uh, any, uh, I should say, any Weinstein presentation as a canonical collection of Weinstein subdomains. So you start, you start attaching handles and suppose you stop at some point and that's, that's what a Weinstein subdomain is. So this, uh, the Weinstein domain on the right, it has these three Weinstein domains on the left as subdomains. Um, so any Weinstein domain has the ball as a subdomain. Okay, and then this uh, yields a natural question, what are all Weinstein subdomains of X? And recall that a, a Weinstein domain, it retracts to, to its singular Lagrangian skeleton. So this is the same uh, as asking, roughly speaking, um, what are all singular Lagrangians of X? So that's kind of the question that we're gonna be interested in. Okay, uh, are there any questions so far? I don't see anything in the chat. Keep going. Okay, now let me talk about the uh, algebraic side a little bit. So the main invariant of a Weinstein domain is the uh, graph fukai category and its objects are twisted complexes um, of embedded exact Lagrangians. And they can either be closed or they can have non-empty boundary. But in that case, their boundary is a Legendrian and it lives in the contact boundary of X. Um, so you start with these Lagrangians, close or with Lagrangian boundary, and you do some kind of algebraic enlargement by taking twisted complexes. Um, it turns out by taking this algebraic enlargement, this category actually becomes uh, quite a bit easier to study. And the morphisms are wrapped floor cochains. So, won't say what that is. Okay, so, so that's what the main algebraic invariant is. 
And now I'll state a theorem of uh, Chantrain de Michigan Rizal, Golovko Guinea, and also Ganatra Pardon Shende, which, which relates the, uh, the geometric presentation of the Weinstein domain to the, the kind of algebraic presentation of the Rapukai category. You should think that the, um, the algebraic presentation has to do with generators. So their theorem is that if X is a Weinstein domain, the index N co-cores, which are Lagrangians with Lagrangian boundary, actually generate the wrapped Foucault category. So, so what, is, what does generate mean? It means that any Lagrangian in X, not necessarily uh, a co-core, is actually isomorphic to a twisted complex of co-cores. So I'll, I'll write it like this. Wx is equal to twa of c1 through ck. Okay. So the co-cores are part of this uh, geometric presentation of x, whereas the generators are part of the algebraic presentation of the rap category. And let me ask a question, which uh, will be relevant at the end of the talk, uh, kind of a converse to this which twisted complexes are isomorphic to single embedded exact Lagrangian. Um, because when you consider the rap category, as I've defined it here, it's this formal algebraic enlargement where you take twisted complexes. So you're in, uh, you're in the world of algebra, you left the world of geometry, but which of those twisted complexes are actually isomorphic to something geometric? So kind of a converse, I'll get back to this question later. Okay. Now let me talk about um, cotangent bundles. So I'll focus mostly on a cotangent bundle of a sphere, although many of the results will actually hold for, for more general Weinstein domains, not even cotangent bundles. So it turns out there's a pretty easy way to get a Weinstein structure on this cotangent model of sphere, you just take a, a Morse function on Sn with uh, two critical points of index zero and n. That's just uh, kind of a smooth handle body presentation of a sphere. Then this gives you a, uh, a wine sheet structure on a cotangent model of a sphere with two handles also of index zero and n. So you just kind of uh, you cotangent, cotangent bundleify. Uh, the original presentation, kind of thicken up the handles. Okay, so, so now we have that this cotangent bundle uh, has a presentation as a single zero handle, which is a bundle, plus a single unhandle attached along some Legendrian. And the claim is that this Legendrian has a name, it's the so-called Legendrian unknot. So here's a picture of the setup. So I start with the bow and I have this Legendrian unknot in the boundary. Here it's, it's drawn uh, in its front projection. And, and if I attach a handle to that, I get, a, I get the cotangent bundle of a sphere. And this handle, it has a co-core, which is a Lagrangian disk. And what, what is it? It's some Lagrangian disk in the cotangent bundle of the sphere. It actually turns out to be a cotangent fiber at, um, at some point. Doesn't matter at which point because all Lagrangian, uh, all cotangent fibers are Lagrangian isotopic. So cotangent bundle of the sphere, it has a, a Weinstein presentation with a single uh, index N handle with co-core which is the cotangent fiber. So by the generation result, that means that the Foucault category of the cotangent bundle of a sphere is actually generated by this cotangent fiber. So it's still a complex is just on the cotangent fiber. Every Lagrangian in the cotangent bundle of a sphere is actually a twisted complex of cotangent fibers. This was um, proven originally by Abu Zaid but it also follows from this more general generation theorem. And uh, finally, you can look at morphisms of, uh, 
cotangent fiber, which is chains on the base loop space. And so you have that this is equal to twisted complexes on the base loop space. Okay. What about closed Lagrangians? Well, the cotangent middle of a sphere, it has a kind of canonical closed Lagrangian, which is the zero section. How does that fit into the picture? Well, it turns out that this Lagrangian unknot, it has a Lagrangian disk filling, which I'll denote by du, and it's contained in the ball. And the zero section is the union of this disk filling and the core of the handle. So you take this Lagrangian unknot, you look at the Lagrangian disk filling, and you cap it off with the core of the handle. And that gives you the, the zero section in the cotangent bundle of the sphere. Okay. And well, the nearby Lagrangian conjecture says that any closed exact Lagrangian the cotangent bundle of the sphere is isotop Lagrangian isotopic to the zero section. And it turns out that there's been quite a bit of progress uh, in that direction. So here's a theorem due to Kai Seidel Smith, uh, Nadler Zaslam, and uh, Abu Zaid. And it says that any closed exact Lagrangian is in the, in the cotangent bundle. It's actually homotopy equivalent to SN, which is the zero section. And there's some stronger results by Abu Zaid on the diffeomorphism class. So what that implies is that any Lagrangian filling of this Lagrangian unknot is homotopy equivalent to a disk. Because if you add some other filling of this Lagrangian that with some different topology, you could also cap it off and get some closed uh, exact Lagrangian with different topology. So all fillings of this Lagrangian unknot are homotopy equivalent to a disk. That's what this theorem implies. More generally, you could, you could consider a different presentation of a cotangent bundle of the sphere. And that's what this talk is going to be about. You could do these moves, um, these handle slides and handle cancellation, handle creation. You could try to get a, a different hypothetical presentation. I suppose this is another presentation for the cotangent bundle of the sphere with possibly a different lambda then it's still true that any Lagrangian filling of lambda is homotopy equivalent to the disk. Because again, if you had a, um, a filling of this hypothetical lambda, which had different topology, then you could also cap it off and get a closed exact Lagrangian that also had different topology from that of the sphere. That would contradict this theorem. So for any presentation, with any possible, um, any presentation of this form and any filling of this hypothetical lambda, any filling is homotopy to this. Okay, so you could, you could hope that uh, you could, that one way to prove the nearby Lagrangian conjecture would be to strengthen this statement and say that, well, for any presentation of a cotangent model sphere, um, that Lagrangian has a disk filling, and furthermore, that disk filling is the Lagrangian, or is the Lagrangian unknot. Right? If you had this hypothetical thing, and so if you had your hypothetical sphere in the cotangent bundle of a sphere, you could, you know, maybe think that you could put it into a Weinstein, um, you know, make it a Weinstein subdomain, and realize it as coming from a filling of the attaching sphere. So if you could prove that any filling this attaching sphere is the unknot, you would be you would be in business. Yes, there's a question. Right, uh, I think Thomas Craig should also be cited. I yes, so yeah, that is a mistake on my part. Um, I actually think this the result of opposite that I'm referring to here actually appears in a paper of Thomas Craig's. So, so definitely. Okay. So again, 
any hypothetical presentation, you know any filling has to be a disk. Um, so the first result I want to say is that in high dimensions, there are actually certain exotic presentations uh, for a cotangent metal sphere. So if n is at least three or real dimension six, there exist infinitely many different Legendrian spheres in the boundary of the standard ball so that when you attach a handle, you get something homotopic to the standard cotangent bundle with its standard uh, Weinstein structure. Furthermore, none of these Legendrians are Lagrangian fillable. So that kind of hypothetical approach to the nearby Lagrangian conjecture that I was um, just explaining does not, does not work. And another thing that I should point out is that, so when I say uh, different, I mean, they're not Legendre isotopic. However, all of these presentations are Weinstein homotopic to each other. So what I mean is the Legendrians aren't isotopic, but there are some uh, Weinstein handle moves that you can do that relate one presentation to the other presentation and that those handle moves necessarily have to involve handle sides. Um, I'll make this explicit uh, later in the talk. So please. Oh, oh, like there's a question from Mohammed who asks whether you mean exact Lagrangian fillable when you say Lagrangian fillable. Uh, yes, yes. So none of these Lagrangians are exact Lagrangian fillable. That's right. Okay. Okay, some comments. So this result is actually false um, for n equals two. Namely, if you have a presentation of the cotangent bundle uh, of the two sphere of the form uh, single zero handle and single two handle, then actually lambda has to be the Legendrian on nut. And this is, um, so this is kind of saying that in this dimension, all presentations are standard. You have to be in high dimensions to see this exotica. Um, and of course, there, there's many other ways in which low dimensional symplectic geometry differs from high dimensional symplectic geometry. Here's another aspect. Okay, now let me state an algebraic version of this theorem. So this is saying that there's many different uh, geometric presentations for the cotangent bundle of the sphere. The algebraic version is that there are actually many different objects um, in the Rafukai category of a sphere that are generators besides uh, the cotangent fiber. Right, that's, that's what this, uh, Okay, as, as we'll see, that's what this theorem uh, will imply because the co-cores of these um, H lambda Ks are going to be generators because this is a presentation where you have a single index and co-core. And so by the generation theorem, it, it is a generator. But the co-cores will not be cotangent fibers. Um, equivalently, these attaching spheres Lambda K, they have different kind of Eliashberg algebras, um, but are called derived vertical, the category of modules over them. It's gonna be the same. Okay. So we move on to the next result, which is about exotic subdomains. And this is uh, a theorem that's joint with Zach Sylvan and now you have to be in even higher dimensions. And this is about um, exotic subdomains, which you should think of as singular Lagrangians in the cotangent monolith sphere. And the theorem says that for any finite collection of primes, uh, possibly containing zero, there exists a Weinstein subdomain, which I'll denote uh, T star S N sub P, P for this collection of primes, so that, first of all, you can compute its Rafukai category. And what it is, is you just 
um, invert that collection of primes in the original Fukai category. So, so here all of my Fukai categories are over the integers. So that's what the that's what this that's what the rap Fukai category is. Um, furthermore, um, you have that this this p subdomain is going to be sitting inside the q subdomain if and only if uh, q is um, is inside of p. And uh, finally, all of the subdomains are diffeomorphic to the cotangent bundle sphere. Of course, they're not symplectomorphic, but you can't tell apart these subdomains from a smooth point of view. So here's the picture you should have in mind. You have the standard cotangent bundle. Sitting inside of it is the subdomain where you've uh, inverted two. Sitting inside that is a subdomain. You inverted three, and then you invert more and more primes, invert arbitrarily many primes, and actually sitting inside all of those subdomains is uh, the so-called flexible cotangent bundle sphere. Um, I'll talk about that in a few minutes, um, but it sits inside all of these other subdomains. And when I say one is a subdomain of the other, if and only if Q is inside of P, I mean that there is no exact embedding, say, of this two, three, or of, of this two subdomain inside of the two, three subdomain, even as a Louisville embedding. So you have this nested embedding of subdomains. There's even more when you take some, some random collection of primes like two, seven, um, but at least you have this many. And I should say there's actually even more subdomains which are not part of this picture. And sit, sitting inside the flexible cotangent bundle are some so-called subflexible um, subdomains constructed by um, Siegel and Murphy. So this is this is not everything. Some questions. Okay, when you include zero, that's right. When you include zero, you get the flexible one. So actually, when you um, when P contains zero, you always um, you always get the same thing, and the subdomain is always the same. It is a zero category, yeah. And the Fukai category of a flexible domain is is the trivial category. That's right. Okay. So some comments. Well, if you look at now the Rapukai category with coefficients that are a finite field, um, say Z, Z mod Q, then the Fukai category of um, this, this P localized subdomain actually agrees with the Fukai category of the cotangent bundle of the sphere if Q is not in P. Because if Q is not in P, then, um, let's see, where's the one? Right, right, so if Q is, is not in P, Sorry, I'm having a, a moment. Um, let me let me let me do the second one first, and then I'll explain the top one. So, if if Q is in P, then um, with F Q coefficients, you're supposed to get the the zero um, category because you're saying on the one hand that in this uh, P localized category Q is invertible. On the other hand, in uh, over FQ, Q is, is zero. So um, the Fukai category with FQ coefficients, if Q is in P, is, is zero. And um, I think for the first claim, again, I'm having a moment, but it's, it's, it's because Q is, um, Q is invertible. 
Okay, let me let me talk about that in the um, question and answer session. But certainly for the second claim, um, if if Q is in P, Q is invertible. On the other hand, in FQ, it's zero. So it's uh, the whole category is zero. Uh, right, so Zach says, right, if uh, Q's not in, okay, well, let, me, let, me, let me move on. Um, so, the, this, there are a couple this, other questions I like, by the okay, way. There's, okay, uh, there's a There's another question from Hero, there's a question from Kyler. Um, okay. You're welcome to un unmute yourselves, so, by the way, to, and ask. Yeah, so Kyler was asking um, what happens for, um, and less than five, and and we don't we don't know. Um, we we don't know what the subdomains of um, some of these low dimensional cotangent bundles are. Um, certainly, when n equals one, it's false because an annulus doesn't have any um, interesting subdomains. Um, and then Hero asks, is Viterbo restriction a localization by those primes in P? but not in Q. Um, so, so in, indeed, uh, that, that's right. If, um, if P contains Q, then um, the P one is, the, the P subdomain is contained in the Q subdomain and the Viterbo restriction is precisely inverting those extra primes that you have, that's right here. Okay, what I wanted to say is that the vanishing of this Fukai category over uh, FQ implies that um, this, this P localized cotangent bundle has no uh, closed exact Lagrangians. Because we know that if there's a single closed exact Lagrangian, the Fukai category um, cannot be zero. Basically because the the singular cohomology of a manifold, of a closed manifold, never vanishes. Right, so once you start going to these subdomains, you have these, their, their skeleton, which is a singular Lagrangian, um, but there's no closed exact Lagrangians. Okay, and I should mention that this is related to previous work of Abu Zaid and Seidel, and they constructed a, um, an abstract cotangent, uh, an abstract Weinstein domain, um, XP, and they show that the symplectic cohomology of XP is equal to the symplectic cohomology of the cotangent bundle, and you invert some collection of primes. Um, and we conjecture that our um, T star uh, SNP is the same as their subdomains. Um, I would say our main contribution here is to show that, in fact, the, these um, Abu Zaid Seidel examples are all sitting inside of the standard cotangent bundle, and they're all sitting inside in a nested way. And in fact, we use part of uh, Abu Zaid and Seidel's construction. Okay. And so we have all of these uh, subdomains of a cotangent bundle of a sphere. And it turns out that um, that the Fukai category is uh, it's kind of anything that um, let me just state the theorem, which is that uh, any y and subdomain X of a cotangent bundle of a sphere, uh, its Fukai category is precisely the wrap Fukai category of the cotangent bundle of a sphere and you invert some primes. So any Weinstein subdomain, uh, its Fukai category agrees with the Fukai category of one of these p-localized subdomains. Yes, question? Oh, okay, so that's a kind of classification, algebraic classification results. Okay, there's a question. You also have a version of the previous theorem. Oh, that's right. 
So, so the previous theorem about constructing these subdomains, that, that holds for, um, for kind of an arbitrary Weinstein domain. You can cook up these p-localized subdomains um, and they're, they're nested, that's right. Um, however, this classification theorem, it, it definitely uses that we're in the setting of cotangent bundles. Like even if you take the boundary connected sum of two cotangent bundles, it has subdomains, the cotangent bundle of M or the cotangent bundle of N, and these are not um, primary localizations. So this classification result saying that any Weinstein subdomain has the same Fukai category as um, these p-localized um, subdomains, that definitely uses that we're in the setting of cotangent bundles. And um, let me just say that the proof involves classifying which twisted complexes in this um, Fukai category, cotangent bundle sphere, are isomorphic to exact Lagrangian disks. So those are the, the main results before moving on. Um, let me pause and see if anyone has any questions. Okay. So, like I said, uh, sitting inside all of these p-localized subdomains is this uh, flexible subdomain. So let me say what, um, what I mean by that. So a flexible Weinstein, what, flexible Weinstein domain is one in which all index N handles have um, Legendre and attaching spheres that are loose. So loose just means that there's a certain zigzag um, that appears in the front projection. Um, so in a second, I'll be kind of clear why this zigzag is important. So for example, there's the flexible cotangent bundle. And what you do is you start with the original presentation of the cotangent bundle of a sphere and you add the zigzag. That's what this um, blue chart is noting. This zigzag is called a loose chart. And now the attaching sphere is called the loose uh, Legendre and unknot. And you attach a handle to that and you get what's called the flexible cotangent bundle of a sphere. Another set of examples are subcritical Weinstein domains. Um, and those are domains which all handles are of index uh, strictly less than n. So either you have no n handles or all n handles are attached along loose Legendrians that have this zigzag. That's what a flexible domain means. And the importance of flexible Weinstein domains comes from the following theorem due to uh, Chilibach and Eli Ashberg building off of work of Murphy that uh, if n is at least three, if flexible, if you have two flexible Weinstein structures, W0, W1, uh, suppose they're on the same smooth manifold that are homotopic through smooth handle moves, then they're actually homotopic through Weinstein handle moves. So smooth handle moves, I mean, the attaching sphere is no longer required to be isotropic. It just is an embedded sphere. Um, and so that's, that's uh, saying that these two presentations are on the topic through smooth handle moves, that's a um, condition from smooth topology. And so the theorem is saying if you have two manifolds that are, have the same smooth topology, they have the same symplectic topology. In fact, this implies that if you have two flexible structures that are diffeomorphic, then they are symplectomorphic. So that's, uh, why these are called flexible. Okay, so now let's try to cook up some flexible subdomains. So um, if X is Weinstein and you have index uh, N cocor C1 through CK, you can just, um, it's called uh, carve out those Lagrangian disks. And each time you carve out those disks, you move the handle and the resulting domain, which I denote x 
uh, complement C1 through CK, where you remove the co-cores or probably remove the index N handles, uh, is subcritical. So I have X and I just remove all the index N handles, that's subcritical, so by definition it's flexible. But that's not a very interesting class of um, flexible subdomains of X because those are subcritical. So now let me describe another way to get flexible subdomains. So let me state an operation, which is called boundary connected sum. I have two disjoint exact Lagrangians, D1 and D2. I have an isotropic arc going from the boundary of D1 to the boundary of D2. And what you can do is you can form the so-called boundary connected sum, which is um, on the right. And this is a new exact Lagrangian. Um, okay. And the theorem is that if n is at least three and x is wedged in with index n co cores C1 through CK, you can first boundary connect some all of these co cores using isotropic arcs. These were all disks, so you get a disk and you can carve out this disk. So remove that handle. The claim is this is a flexible Weinstein subdomain. So, so instead of just removing C1 through CK, which gives you a subcritical domain, I'm first taking the isotropic connected sum and then I'm removing that. So equivalently, there exists a flexible subdomain VFlex so that uh, I can attach a single handle to it, get back X and the co-core of this handle is this boundary connected sum of C1 through CK. Okay, so that's a more general flexible subdomain, which is, is not always subcritical. Okay, so, okay, here I'm just restating the result that there's this VFlex, so that X is um, VFlex plus a single N handle, and for VFlex, Weinstein handle moves are the same as smooth handled moves. That's this uh, flexibility theorem of Chilibach, Eliashberg, and Murphy. So you can first take this presentation of X into V flex in a single handle. You can do a bunch of uh, smooth handle moves to V flex, and you can upgrade by the flexibility results to a whole Weinstein homotopy. So you can use this to get Weinstein presentations with a few handles. Um, because, well, VFlex uh, smoothly, it basically has the same number of handles as X. And now, or at least, or sometimes one more, and now you have this extra handle, H sub lambda. So the corollary of this is that if N is at least three, then, um, X has a Weinstein presentation that has at most two more Weinstein handles than the minimum number of smooth handles for X. So again, the proof is essentially you take this decomposition of X into V flex plus a single handle, you kill most of the handles, or you, you kill all the handles that you can smoothly for V flex, and now you have this extra handle sitting up top, and that's what contributes um, that's why there's some extra handles that um, you sometimes need. Uh, and this result is sharp. Sometimes you do need two more Weinstein handles than smooth handles. Uh, for example, for exotic Weinstein balls, smoothly you just need one handle, but for a Weinstein presentation, you do need three handles. And let me just state that it's actually unknown whether this result is true in dimension two. Okay, so this is, again, an example where the high dimensionality is, is crucial. Okay. Let me talk about the proof of the theorem. So let's just do the case where there's two index N co-cores, say C1 and C2, and then the claim is, if you uh, carve out this disk C1 boundary connect some C2, this is flexible. 
in particular it's a wine sheet domain so you need to realize um, c1 boundary connects some c2 as the co-core of some presentation and the idea is that the handle slides doing handle slides changes the co-cores by some kind of boundary connected sum. So we'll be able to do some handle slides and make C1 connect some C2 a co-core. So here's the picture. So I have two handles, uh, co-cores C1 and C2, let's call the attaching spheres lambda one and lambda two. Then when I do a handle slide, so let me call the new co-cores C1 bar and C2 bar the attaching spheres lambda one and lambda two bar. So it's, it's known that it's actually proven by Castles and Murphy that the attaching spheres change in this way. So I'm sliding lambda one over lambda two. So lambda one bar, at least topologically, becomes a connected sum of um, lambda one and lambda two. Okay. So that's what happens to the attaching spheres when I do the spindle slide. What happens to the co-cores? Well, the proposition is that the co-core uh, C1, it doesn't change. So C1 bar is equal to C1. The claim is C2 bar becomes um, C1 boundary connected sum C2. So what's the intuition for this? Um, in this picture doesn't look like anything has really changed, but the picture is a little bit deceiving. Um, the, the point is that when you handle slide the first handle over the second handle, the, um, you have to cross the boundary of the co-core of C. So you have to cross the boundary of C2. The handle has to cross the boundary of C2, and when you do that, that's when C2 gets modified and it picks up this extra C1 term. So that's why C1 bar is C2 plus uh, C1. Okay, so now we have this presentation with C1 and C1 boundary connects some C2. Well, what happens if we remove C1 uh, boundary connects some C2? Well, that's just deleting that handle, the second handle. So we um, remove the second attaching sphere and now we have uh, just lambda one bar, and that has a loose chart, this zigzag right here. So at the end of the day, we're left with just this handle attached along lambda one bar, and so it's a flexible point sheet structure. So that's, that's the proof of the, of the main theorem. And let me mention that there's, um, Th that this is a special type of handle slide. Uh, for more general handle slides, the co-core will not be C1 boundary connects some C2 along an isotropic arc, but rather um, along a reb chord. And lambda one bar will, will no longer be loose. So this is quite a special situation when you carve out this isotropic uh, connected sum. Okay. Now let's do an example. Let's apply this to a uh, cotangent bundle of a sphere and get a homotopy. So let's start with a standard presentation where I have a hand attached along the unknot. Its co-core is uh, a single cotangent fiber at some point Q. And I add two canceling handles. So it turns out when I add two canceling handles, um, there's a single, index and or du. So presentation where I just have single cotangent fiber and this grunted on that du. Okay. It says my connection is unstable, but okay, handle slide the first uh, the top handle over the second handle. Well, what happens? The, however, the co-core of the second handle, it, it 
it does change. It picks up the rotate. Now I have this bar here. This bar refers to um, I'm picking a different orientation on the cotangent fiber, and that's just because I'm adding an extra twist before doing this handle slide. Um, and I I can orient the handles. So when I orient the the black attaching sphere, I see that um, there's kind of one direction that goes into the handle, one direction that goes out. So there's one arrow that goes in and one arrow that goes out. And that reflects the fact that um, I have this opposite orientation on the second cotangent fiber. Okay, well, let me, let me do this again. Do another handle slide of the top one over the bottom one. Again, the top one's co-core doesn't change, still cotangent fiber. The bottom one's co-core, when I say bottom one, I mean this thread Legendre. So the attaching sphere, it doesn't look like it's changing, but its co-core actually is changing. And it's picking up this extra cotangent fiber. And these are all presentations for um, the standard cotangent below the sphere. So you might ask, well, why is this interesting? Well, recall that any Weinstein presentation gives me some canonical collection of subdomains. So let's see, those subdomains, you could think of as removing the handles or equivalently removing the co-cores. So let's remove this last co-core, move this red attaching Legendre, and now I have this picture. And it's oriented, so I have two uh, directions, kind of two branches going out, one branch going into the handle. So I know that this is a flexible Weinstein domain. It's flexible because it has it has this loose chart, this zigzag. So I remove this co-core and it's a flexible wedge domain. There's three intersections between these handles, but the algebraic intersection number is, is one. I have three, two going in, one going out. So you can check it's, uh, it's smoothly a ball and it's flexible. So it's actually the standard ball. So the point is that if I start with the cotangent fiber, so, sorry, cotangent bundle, remove this boundary connects some of three cotangent fibers, one with the opposite orientation, I get the standard ball back with a flexible structure. But I can also do this at a previous stage uh, back here. So I could have removed the, the cocor at that stage. And at that stage, the cocor is just the boundary connects some of two cotangent fibers one with the opposite orientation. And in that case, there's kind of two branches of this attaching sphere that go through the handle, both with opposite orientations. And you can check that this is um, diffeomorphic to a cotangent bundle of a sphere with an N minus one handle. And, and it's flexible, it still has a loose chart. So it's in fact a flexible um, cotangent bundle of a sphere with a and minus one handle attached. So that's how you can see that the flexible cotangent bundle sits inside the standard cotangent bundle. Okay. So, okay, what we've proved is that if you start with the standard cotangent bundle, remove this sum of three cotangent fibers, you get the standard ball back. Equivalently, what this means is that there's Legendrian, which I'll denote by lambda three, so that when you attach a handle to it, you get um, the standard cotangent bundle back. And the co-core of this handle is, oh, sorry, this is, there's a typo here. The co-core of this handle is the boundary connected sum of three cotangent fibers. Right, that's what it means to to say that we get the standard ball back um, when we remove this um, boundary connect sum of three cotangent fibers. And since its co-core is not cotangent fiber, it's not a single cotangent fiber, that means lambda three is not isotopic to lambda u, which is the Legendre not in the standard presentation. 
So this is this uh, exotic presentation that I was talking about. And furthermore, it's easy to compute the rap fluoromology of this cocor. You can use that to show that this um, Legendre is not Lagrangian fillable. Let me, let me go back a slide and say what this lambda three is. This lambda three is precisely in this, uh, um, on the right row, sorry, in the, the right column in the middle row, we have this red Legendre and it looks very standard, but after you um, identify, when you cancel all these handles and identify the black Legendre, with the handle attached to the standard ball, this red Legendrian becomes something uh, very non-standard. So the, even though it looks standard in this picture, it's um, uh, non-standard Legendrian. Okay. And it's not Lagrangian syllable. Okay, well, let's, let's go back to the algebra. So it turns out that, so, so what we've done is we've, um, created a Weinstein presentation for the cotangent bundle of a sphere that has um, a single end handle whose cocor is this boundary connected sum of three cotangent fibers, one with the opposite orientation. So since it's the only index in cocor, that means it's a generator. And also note that this isotropic connected sum is precisely a direct sum in the Fukai category. So the claim is this direct sum of three cotangent fibers with a shift of one, one of them actually generates the wrap category. And this actually is true for, uh, for any category in any object. For any object A, it turns out that if you take A plus A plus A with a shift, this actually generates A. Um, note that this is not true if, um, if I had taken just A direct sum A or A direct sum A with a shift. I really have to use um, three where one is the opposite orientation. And you can check this explicitly. Um, you have to take two cones on this triple direct sum to get back A. And note that I'm not saying uh, that this direct sum split generates because it clearly split generates, I'm saying that this direct sum of three copies actually generates A. So somehow the geometry is reflecting this, um, this algebraic statement right here. Okay, so now let me try to make that precise. So the geometric statement, the geometric flexibility statement that we have is that if X has some collection of co-cores, C1 through CK, and you know that suppose this, uh, this boundary connected sum generates a middle dimensional homology, then the claim is that X has a presentation with a single cocor, which is this boundary connected sum. That's precisely what we did um, for, for the cotangent bundle of a sphere when we removed this uh, triple direct sum and we got a ball. To show that it was a ball, we had to look at the, the algebraic um, intersection numbers, which is a homology computation. So um, maybe maybe said another way. So I have X, I remove this connected sum, and, and if it generates, that means that flexible subdomain doesn't have any uh, index and handles. And so X has a presentation with a single index and co-core. That's just this uh, ice dropping up, boundary connected zone. Okay. Well, that implies that this ice dropping connected sum, which is isomorphic to um, the direct sum in the Fukai category, generates the right Fukai category. So the consequence is if I have these co-cores, which are each generators, and I know that they're direct sum, generates homology, then I actually know that the direct sum generates. N not only do, do each of these k things generate, but the single object generates. Okay, well this sounds very much like a um, algebraic statement, 
In fact, um, this is reflected in the algebra. So now let C be an arbitrary triangulated category. The algebraic analog um, is this theorem of Thomason, which is that if you have some collection of generators, A1 through AK of C, and you know that the direct sum generates the Grotendieck group of the category, then the direct sum actually generates the category. So this is very similar to the same I had before, except um, here we have the Grotendieck group that appears, whereas before I had singular um, cohomology in degree n appears. But otherwise, they're exactly the same statement because C1 through CK are generators, this isotropic sum is, um, is equal to the direct sum. So what's the relationship between these two theorems? Like how, how does one relate the geometric flexibility and the algebraic flexibility of Thomson's theorem? Well, again, the main difference was in one I had singular cohomology, in the other one we had the Grondieck group appearing. And the link is that if X is a Weinstein domain, then there actually is a surjective homomorphism from singular cohomology in degree n to the ground D group, taking a n co-cycle to any point gray dual Lagrangian representative. So, um, so this means that if I have some collection of co-cores and I know the isotropic connected sum generates uh, cohomology, that means it generates the Grondi group because there's a surjective homomorphism. And once I know this thing generates the Grondi group, by Thomas' theorem, it actually generates the category. So that's how you can use this theorem plus Thomason's theorem to, to get you know, an algebraic analog of um, the geometric flexibility result that I stated before. So to rephrase this theorem, if I have two Lagrangians which have the same class, they actually define the same class in the Grotendieck group. And this is this, this theorem actually holds for any n. Recall that the f symplectic flexibility results, they all required n to be at least three. Whereas this theorem and Thomason's theorem they, they don't know anything about the um, the dimension of the Weinstein domain. Um, Thomson's theorem doesn't works for all categories. Um, so, okay, and the, the proof. Oh, sorry. This, uh, right, and, the, and the proof. Let me just say very quickly is that. Actually, the n minus one handles do play a role. The n minus one handles, uh, they give relations in n-dimensional singular uh, cohomology because that's how you get the differential. And the claim is they also give you relations in the Rapukai category. There are some acyclic twisted complexes which um, appear in the Rapukai category, which come from the index n handles. Okay. So I think this is this is a good place to stop. Thank you for listening. Uh, okay, let's thank Oleg for his talk. Questions for Oleg? Uh, there's a question from Hero. Hero, feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself. Ah, Hero can't unmute at the moment. Uh, I'll, I'll read it just so everyone has it. Going back to your solo theorem that non-standard Legendrians can give inequivalent Weinstein presentations for T star SN. In T star SN, the standard Legendrian sphere has the feature that there's a non-symmetric monoidal structure on W for which the co-core, the cotangent fiber, is the unit. Is this geometrically articulable, i.e., can you show that these other Legendrian spheres have co cores that aren't naturally units of monoidal structures? Um, 
Okay, I'm trying to understand the question. So, <clears throat> Wait, oh no, I think I might have, did I exit out of something? Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what the question is asking. Um, the papers are not eager, but... I mean, the, the cohort is this um, direct sum of three copies of a uh, cotangent fiber where one of them has a shift by one. And then, you know, that's a purely algebraic statement. So I, I don't know how to answer your question, but um, I think that information should be enough to answer it if I knew the, the definition of some of these things. Um, but I think from the Kai category point of view, it's clear what the, the cohort is. Other questions? Sorry, just just to this is not a question, just a comment. Uh, it's the cohort in this. I mean, this is a case where we don't even, we don't expect that there is any closed exact Lagrangian. Uh, you mean filling of the, of the attaching sphere? No, I'm sorry. In, in, in these, in these, um, in these things that look like, you know, T oh. and something inverted. Oh, okay. But I don't think that's what Hero was asking about. Well, all I'm trying to say is that, oh. It's going to be it's like we don't know how to put something on this, whatever the skeleton is, it's going to be difficult to put something on the skeleton, an object on the skeleton that would act as the unit, because we don't know how to put any object on the skeleton. Uh -huh. That's, that's true. We only know how to put, you know, we only know about this, you know, route cat whatever this category because of things which are transverse, you know, kind of the fibers. So, I mean, that doesn't you know, there could still be some monoidal structure that we cannot see, we cannot access by some magical reason, but it would be very far from, um, from, from, certainly not as simple as for T star SN. How about that? There's a question from Yin. Yin, you're welcome to unmute yourself if you'd like to as well. So I just want to ask a simple question. When do you expect the map from HN to K0 to be isomorphism? Um, P, well, when you say PSS, you mean the acceleration map from? From HN to symplectic cohomology. Right. Uh, so so, indeed, um, I think there's some lower bounds on the image of various things. Let's see. Yeah, I'm not sure. That's a, that's a good question. Um, So, so, okay, yeah, yeah, the statement is that um, the image of, okay, I, I think we may, maybe you already know this, the image of this uh, PSS map or this acceleration map um, in SH agrees with um, the image of K0 under the Dennis Trace map and the um, yes. open closed map. Yes. So, yeah, I, th I think that's what you're refer referring to. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know anything. So, what can be extracted from that type of statement? So yeah, you can get lower bounds on what uh, K zero is coming from how big the image is. 
Uh, also, have you thought about whether you can you can use your map with the construction of the map from H n to K zero to prove that a, a spherical object can can never defy phantom in the Foucault categories? Can you can you say it again? A sphere. A spherical object cannot defy a phantom in the Foucault category. Fair. Are you saying spherical or aspherical? Spherical. Spherical, a spherical object cannot define a wait, wait. A spherical object cannot define. Oh, uh, uh, which, 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 what, well, I just mean like proving the class of a spherical object is, is non trivial in the Grotonic gro group. Ah, uh, uh, right, right, right. Uh, Right, so, okay, so, so I, I think what you're getting at is, um, is there any way to show that closed exact Lagrangians have non-trivial um, cohomology classes? Yes, exactly, using, it's a great regular Lagrangian class. conjecture, but I'm, I'm yeah. just talking about the simplest case. Right, right. Um, and I, yeah, I've thought about it, and I, 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 I th there wasn't an easy way that I could see that nice. one could use this argument to prove something like that. Um, right, like, like suppose X is a is a ball, a smoothly a ball, and you want to rule out um, closed exact Lagrangians. The the issue is that um, one of the issues is that this this map uses um, that X is, let's see, well, it uses that X is Weinstein, but, well, anyway, I won't be able to recover the argument, but, but I, I thought about this, and I'd be happy to talk about it more. Um, somehow I became convinced that um, something like that could not be extracted from this, but, but I might I be wrong. That. Yeah, but we can talk about it in a, in a few minutes. Okay. Any other questions for Oleg before we move to uh, discussion period? Ah, uh, there's a question about uh, where where the recordings are. Uh, so, uh, if if you go to our seminar web page, there's a um, a link called videos, and if you click that, recordings will be posted there. Okay, well, uh, let's thank Oleg again.